after we finish up with Judges, especially these last few chapters, and all of the goofy ball stuff that's taken place, it's going to be refreshing to get into the book of Ruth. Let's pray. Lord, um, we want you to teach us this morning by the power of your Spirit as we uh, seek to understand these uh, things in these last few chapters of the book of Judges and not only understand what happened way back in those days, but how we can take and apply stuff and learn from these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor sent me a text this morning and said he's praying for us. Didn't say where he was or what he was doing. He just says, I'm praying for you. Have a great, have a great morning. We think he's probably still with his daughter and family down in on the coast. So, and then they're probably going to head out on a, to Oregon. So, pray for them that they'll just have a good relaxing time. Yeah. Okay, we're in the book of Judges. And last five chapters I mentioned uh, are kind of a appendix and or supplement to the history of the period of the judges. Very much inspired. That doesn't take away from the inspiration of them. It's just that the, those first 20 chapters or so are chronological in order, whereas these last five chapters are not. And, <clears throat> pardon? I don't know. I don't know. There, a reason is, is not given. And uh, if you didn't have certain references there, that reference going back, you probably wouldn't know. And, but you have, uh, like I mentioned, Phineas. Well, let me read this. For example, the time of the account we have in chapter 19 probably took place early in the period of the judges since Phineas, the grandson of Aaron, is mentioned in the 28th verse of chapter 20. So in Phineas and Aaron, they were way back there. So uh, last week, in beginning to look at chapter 19, we, we looked at uh, up through verse... 21. And so we want to go on further through here. Uh, one of the themes of chapter 19 is the, just one of the themes is the moral depravity, if you please, which runs all the way through it. And the Levite who should have been faithful to one wife, decides to take a girlfriend, a concubine, whom he lives with, and in turn she's unfaithful to him. And the implication is that as a result, the Levite sends her packing. And she decides to go back home to daddy. And after four months, the Levite decides he wants her back, and so he goes off to find her. And the scene at the father's house is one of undisciplined self-indulgence, if you please. A, a three-day binge extends to a fourth day and a fifth. And the, the father-in-law keeps saying, refresh yourself, refresh yourself. And so he sticks around, and they hang out, and they, they eat, drink, and be merry. And so uh, this is an atmosphere of moral laxity, if you please. And eventually the girl and the Levite 
leave the home, but too late to complete their journey before nightfall. So rejecting the alien city of the Jebusites, that's in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 19, they go on to the Israelite tri, um, town of Gibeah, where they are eventually offered hospitality by an old man from Ephraim. Ephraim and that's where we, we left him last, last week. He brought them into his house, gave fodder to the donkeys, they washed their feet, and they ate and drank. A lot of eating and drinking going on. And they weren't drinking water entirely. So the old man says to him, uh, verse 20, Peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. So he really exercises some good um, hospitality. He says, only don't spend the night in the open square. And I mentioned to you that the city squares in that day were, were uh, a haven for those who would pray, P-R-E-Y, on visitors or less than fortunate or whatever. So... He's in, like I mentioned, he, he brought him into his house, gave fodder to the donkeys. They washed their feet and ate and drank. Now, follow along. I'm going to read verses 22 to 30, and then uh, I'll comment on its horrid, horrid content. So follow along as I read here. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house and the old man saying, bring out the man who came to your house. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. But the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, no, my brethren, I beg you, don't act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come into my house, do not commit this outrage. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Humble them and do with them as you please, but to this man do not do such a vile thing. But the men would not heed him. So the man, that is a Levite, took his concubine and brought her out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. Verse 26, then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. And when her, when her master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way, there was his concubine fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. And he said to her, get up and let's be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey, and the man got up and went to his palace, or went to his place. When he entered his house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, and divided her into twelve pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And so it was that all who saw it said, No such deed has been done or seen from the day from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer about it, and then speak up about it. Mm. Now, this horrible event that we just read took place in the city of Gibeah. And <clears throat> Gibeah at this time had become like the city of Sodom. And those of us who have been around the scriptures, or even those of us who haven't been around the scriptures, have heard about Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom was a city so wicked that God wiped it off the face of the earth. Remember that? Genesis chapter 19 is the reference if you're taking any notes. And so some men of the city of Gibeah were perverted men. Notice verse 22 again. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city perverted men. So the men of the city were indulging, 
probably habitually in immoral practices that were contrary in nature. And this practice was homosexuality. Basically, that's plus, plus a bunch of other stuff. Now, let me read something for you, and you can, you can make note of these verses if you want. Look them up later. Uh, Romans chapter... Romans chapter 1, verses 24, 25, 26, and 27. Listen to this. Therefore, uh, talking about uh, people who worship the creature more than the creator. It says, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use. Got that natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, error which was due. And then uh, back to Leviticus, all the way back to Leviticus chapter 18. Notice verse 22. Nor shall you mate with any animal to devile yourself with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. And perfect. Well, let me read here. Uh, oh, verse 20. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. That's the verse I wanted. And then in chapter 20 of Leviticus, verse 13. If a man lies with a male, as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Remember the, the, one of the things about murder? He said... And the blood will the, the blood will be on the hands of of whoever commits the murder, but in this case, as far as the homosexual uh, person is concerned, says th their blood shall be on their hands, on their own, on their hands. Okay, and then First Corinthians in the New Testament, First Corinthians, chapter six. Verse, verses 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, for homose nor homosexuals, etc., nor sodomites, etc., etc. Now, how about a homosexual or someone involved in these practices who comes to know the Lord. And that's happened. Okay? So notice, 1 Corinthians, and let's, let's follow on here, 1 Corinthians 6. says, Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And verse 11, and such were some of you, but, one of the greatest words in Scripture, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You cannot believe, or maybe you can, some of the stuff that the prisoners here in, 
in, in Redway or the, the guys at the mission, some of the stuff and sins and vile behavior that they have been involved in. Dave. Not just them, it's people that come in this room. You bet. You Myself bet. included. You bet, see. But, don't you love that? But you were washed. But you were washed. Hallelujah. That's hallelujah stuff. And, and when, we come to, when we come to him, we're washed by the blood of Jesus, see. And he covers all that stuff, see. I, I mentioned stuff like that, you know, and, and uh, the guys will, will go time to time, and, and sometimes I, I bring them in, or they'll come into my office, and I'll say, okay, tell me about some of the stuff that you were involved with. So they'll tell me. And I'll turn to this. And I'll say, you know what? John, here's the neat thing. But you were washed. And all of a sudden, they just break down and they weep. Yep, I was. That's behind. That's behind. Mm. And the, no, the word no here in this uh, 22nd verse of chapter 19, the word no simply means to have sexual intercourse with. These sinners were excited because a new man was in town and they wanted to enjoy him. Horrible thing. Horrible thing. We need to say that. This is a horrible thing. We need to realize that. Don't glorify this. Some people want to flaunt it nowadays. But uh, it just turns my stomach. People take pride and they march and stuff like that. It's horrible. It's horrible. Verse 23. The host, the old man, courageously and correctly, correctly uh, described their desires as wicked and outrageous. But the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, don't act so wickedly, seeing this man has come into my house. Do not commit this outrage. And he tried to prevent these perverts from raping his male guest. But, notice what he does. Look, he says, verse 24, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Humble them. In other words, bring them low. Intimidate them. Um, torment them. Make them feel like dirt. Mm. Humble them. Do with them as you please. But to this man... Do not do such a vile thing. And by comparison, check this out and listen closely. I have a feeling that he felt, I mean, women were held in very low esteem, okay, especially concubines. We've, we've covered that, you know, and uh, concubines were just like a mistress. They were kind of a throwaway gal, and, uh, and so, um, but in comparison, even though the 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 uh, uh, women were thought very little of. Yet this, this uh, sin, let's call it for what it is, this sin of homosexuality, probably in the mind of this man was even more despicable. And he didn't want to send 
the, the guest out, he was an honored guest as far as his hospitality he already declared that. He didn't want to send the honorable guest out. But here's this concubine, concubine and his virgin daughter. Dave. He offers up his daughter and his concubine, but he only brings out his concubine. The, the okay. Levite, the, the Levite heads out with the, with the concubine. And the old man probably had a virgin daughter. That's it. He says, look, here is my virgin daughter. Uh, the, the old man says this to the group outside. And so he has a virgin daughter. And the man's concubine, let me bring them out now. See. Are we talking about two different men? Yeah, two different guys. Okay, so the, was the it the master of the house probably has a a virgin daughter. Okay, and the visitor has a concubine. Right. Okay. The Levite makes... has a concubine. Okay. He's the one that has the, the concubine. And so uh, go forward in the story, they refuse them. Yeah. And it goes on and then the man, the Levite, puts his concubine out there. Yeah. Not the not the host. Yeah. Plus, in, in those days, their culture and their hospitality etiquette declared that he protect his guest. Yeah. Otherwise, he dishonored himself as well. Right. You, did you catch that? Yeah. Okay. So, and this harkens back again to Lot and Sodom. And like Lot and Sodom, the host offered them his daughter, which shows the low estimate some men in that day had of women and of sexual purity. Not all men were that way, but some were. How, and, and here's the, this what this what's, needs to blow our minds. How a father could offer his own daughter as a sacrifice to the lust of a mob is difficult to understand. But, make no mistake about it, it's done in the culture in which we live today. It is. Mm. Mm. Oh, boy. That these two men, the old man and his guest, would cowardly and selfishly give their daughter and concubine over to perverted, abusive men to save themselves was an extreme example of where sin and lawlessness leads. When we, don't want, when we begin to do what's right in our own eyes and we carry that through, we become a perfect commentary on what Jeremiah says, that, a, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know? See? And so that's where that stuff leads us. It leads us to s extreme sin and extreme lawlessness. So the, the guest of the old man puts his concubine out of the house, and the, the perverts abuse her all night, and she limps back to the old man's house nearly dead. Verses 25 and 26. But the men would not heed him. So the man took his concubine, and he brought her out to them, and they knew her, again, had sex with her, knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. Now, oh, tough stuff. I'll be glad to get through this. Now, I want you to notice the callousness of the guest as it relates to his concubine. Verse 27. When her master, when her master arose in the morning. What do you think about when you read that? Do you think about what I'm thinking? He slept through the night while she was outside being taken advantage of. And they probably took her to the local city square. 
because that's where all these these perverted men that's where all they, they that's where they gathered how could he have slept knowing that he he not only turned over his concubine to wicked men but the men were abusing her while he slept Here's another thing. There's no indication in our text here that the Levite had any concern for his concubine. Has he determined to leave Gibeah? Notice again verse 27. When her master rose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. He was just going to head out. He wasn't going to check on her. Probably. He was just going to head out. Sad. This is a sad story. But you've got to keep in mind, it takes place in our culture today. Not, hopefully not in our Christian culture. But it certainly does, you know. Mm. So what's he do now? So what's he do now? Look what he does. He went out to go his way. There was his concubine fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. And he says to her, Get up, woman. Let's go home. Well, that's not what, exactly what the text says, but that's the thrust of it. He says, and he said to her, Get up. Let's get going. Hmm. But there was no answer. But there was no answer. There was no response. Why? She was dead. Hmm. Pardon? Isn't there something significant about her hands being on the threshold? Doesn't that mean something? Um, I think it's someplace else in Scripture, if I remember. I'll check. It, it could very well be. I didn't come across anything, but it could be. Or maybe I did, and I didn't pay attention to it. Now keep in mind, this account not only reflects the brutality of the perverted men of Gibeah, but it also reflects the cold, cold indifference of the Levite. His harsh words, get up and let's get going, really reveal his unconcern and his sin and his depravity. And I need to mention here, so listen up. By sending the cut up pieces, no, wait a minute, that's, that's not what I want yet. Let me turn this over. I'll get back to that. When the Levite, when he discovers that his concubine is dead, catch this now, he lifts her up, puts, Scripture says he lifts her up and puts her on the dome. He lifts her up and like, throws her like a, a sack of feed that he just picked up at the local market. He lifts her up, puts her on his donkey, and he heads home to Ephraim. Notice the last part of verse 28. Get up and let us be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her under the donkey, and the man got up and went to his place. Now, it gets worse. It gets worse. When the Levite arrived home, he cuts his concubine's body into 12 pieces. And he sends the 12 pieces throughout the 12 tribes in the territory of Israel. Now, why did he do this? Here's the the deal. This act was designed to show the 12 tribes 
what particular sin the tribe of Benjamin was guilty of and to provoke the tribes to render judgment on the guilty tribe. A parallel summons to war took place when King Saul cut up two oxen and sent them throughout Israel to muster an army. The reference there is 1 Samuel. I think I have that tagged, and I do. 1 Samuel chapter 11. Verse 1, the Naash, the, the Ammonite, came up and encamped against Jabez, Gilead. And, and so uh, he, he said, on this condition I'll make a covenant with you that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on all of Israel. And when King Saul heard about that, and they told him, and he he. The spirit, verse 6 says, Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. So he took a yoke of oxen, cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. So it was a rallying point in those days. It was a rallying point. And I submit to you, there was a better way to handle this. He could have gone to the, to the tabernacle, which was in Shiloh. Wasn't that far away. But like we said before, when it comes to, to uh, when, when we're complacent, we don't want to go out of our way to worship God. We want to do what's right in our own eyes. And he could have gone to Shiloh, this Levite priest, catch that? Levite? He was the priestly order. He was in line. He was in the priestly order. But he strayed so far away. Perfect example of preachers and leaders and everything like that who stray away from the Lord. Dave, you had a question or comment? Yeah, you, but you, you went to it. It was The guy who was striking me is quite the hypocrite. And... Uh, and being a Levite and then all this whooping it up and da-da-da-da, sending out his concubine, being very um, unsympathetic to her plight yeah. and all that. And then he sends out this call to arms to everybody. Yeah. And I'm going, this guy's a total hypocrite. I may be reading it wrong, but no, that's what I'm hearing. No, you're reading it properly. He was. And... Sending the dissected pieces of the corpse to the tribes was a symbolic act by which the crime committed upon the murdered woman was placed before the eyes of the whole nation to summon, summon it to punish the crime. Now, I want to mention here that by sending, now pay, pay close attention, you probably already got this, by sending the cut-up pieces of his concubine's body to the tribes of Israel to mobilize support of the tribes of Israel and punish the men of Gibeah who had killed his concubine, it was, in fact, the Levite who had let them kill her. Got that? Now, ooh, so when he entered his house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, Verse 29, divided her into 12 pieces, limb by limb, sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And notice the last verse of chapter 19. No such deed, and so it was that all who saw it said, no such deed has been done or seen from the, from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it confer about it, and speak up. These words, verse 30, are a picture of outrage mixed with confusion, mixed with weakness, mixed with the inability to know what to do. And that's what happens, folks, when we do that which was right, is right in our own eyes. We reach a point where we know what to do when we 
don't want to do. So we, we continue to do what's right in our own eyes. That's why there's prisoners out there down the road here. That's why there's guys at the mission needing help because they've, they've lived a life of doing what's right in their own eyes. So if you're here this morning and somewhere along the line you're still doing that which is right in your own eyes, stop it. Just stop it. If everyone is used to doing what is right in his own his or her own eyes, how can anyone get a grip on the situation? And the dismembered body of the Levite's concubine that was circulated piece by piece among the twelve tribes of Israel brought home in an unmistakably violent and horrific way the appalling moral degradation into which the nation of Israel had sunk. Mm. Judges chapter 20 provides the re record of how the people of Israel tried to deal with the problem. Tune in next week for that. Read chapter 20. And if you want to finish up the book, read chapter 21. We have somewhat of a little bit of a revival, but not much. Not much. Because the end of Judges, the last verse says, and everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Oh, Thank you for your love that's exhibited to people who have been involved in, this, in these situations, yet when they come to Christ, you forgive it and you wash them. If there's any way we, anything we can take away from this, let's take away the fact that, that when, when we come to the Lord, regardless of what we've done, and say, Lord, Forgive me. I confess it. God answers back and he washes us clean because of the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ whom the scripture says binds up wounds and heals us. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you hang around, you're going to get more of me this morning. Uh, I got to...